with us today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Again. Well, hypertensive resuscitation, uh, it's one of these things that's just been evolved over the last, uh, I don't know, we started back in the late 90s, I guess, with Greg Max on paper. But the big thing is, is you have a trauma patient, they're hypotensive, you slap that IV in, what do you do? When do you get fluids? When do you not get fluids? So the, that's exactly what I want to cover today. These are combat wounds. Pray to God you never see them. You get a mass casualty though from a number of mechanisms, you will see people that come in there bleeding. Once in a while you'll have a patient that's hypotensive due to gunshot wound or penetrating tunnel. You have to decide in the field, first responders, when do you give the fluids? So shock is the abnormality in the circulatory system. They're not getting enough blood. They're hypotensive, hypovolemic, and they're tachycardic, and you're thinking, oh my gosh, I gotta do something. But when do, you do any, when do you do something about that? Well, you have to understand the basic physiology of shock. This is the book learning part, the boring part, but it's good to understand that depolarizing the cell membrane leads to the uptake of cellular water, and you lose that membrane integrity. You get that it's proportional to the severity of the end organ hypoperfusion, and your intracellular fluid gets sequestered and leads to your extracellular fluid deficit hypovolemia. Bad news. So it further uncouples your cellular process, you start to go down in acidosis. Train wreck, badness. So what do you do? What are you going to do when you see these patients first? You guys are first responders, I'm talking to you. I was a first responder before I went to medical school and an EMT paramedic, I did all that. First thing you do, and I'm going to emphasize this over and over again, stop the bleeding. You got to stop that hemorrhage. We reversed our immediate trauma. Protocols, you know, AOA, breathing, circulation, no, stop the bleeding because without that blood, nothing else matters. So you want to put direct pressure on it, you want to pack it, you want to use tourniquets, tourniquets early, tourniquets often, I'm, I'm alluding to Dr. Barnes' lecture yesterday, your mortality goes down, survivability goes up, tourniquets are a good thing, please take that home as a message for this stage. Hemostatic dressings, there's chitosan, there's uh, kaolin, which is combat cause, there's not the cellulose products like Axel. It doesn't matter, okay? If you have a hemostatic agent and they're still bleeding, use it. Use whatever you have. It doesn't have to always go in that order. Use what you have. So, how do you do controlled resuscitation, a permissive hypotension? Well, that was you know, sacrilegious back in the 90s. I mean, Greg Maddox, he's from Texas, came out and said, hey, you gotta let the, you can't put fluids in right away. Um, because, you know, they're still talking to the mentating. There's no real reason to. They may be tachycardic, but here's the key. Excessive fluid resuscitation can increase the bleeding or re-bleeding. You can pop the clot, so to speak. Think about it. If you're maintaining your central pressures and you, you have lost a lot of blood, that's fine, but there's no reason to jump onto the fluids, especially with crystalloid. I'll talk about that in a minute. But prior to definitive hemorrhage control, a lower than normal blood pressure may be acceptable. That in the readings wise, a max approximately 50 or your stop blood pressure less than um, 80, then, or a decrease in mentation, that's key, then you can give them a little bit of fluid at that point if you're in the field before they get to Dr. Coakley or Dr. Barnes in the emergency department. So the field assessment, when it, you have to have fast, low tech, ready to recognize on the track in the field. You have to be able to say, I don't have my million dollar piece of gear. How do I do this? How do we do this? We taught all of our medics in the military how to recognize this. Started out with special operations. Thank goodness it trickled over into the regular forces. So the best field tactical indicators of shock are, they're not thinking, they're in decreased consciousness. They're babbling, they end up not being their normal self. That's a really good start point right there. So uh, if they've had a TBI, of course, that's not going to be much help. But if you have a patient that has an extremity bleed or other types of bleeding, that's when you start to think, I need to give this person some fluids. If there's an abnormal character to the radio pulse, this is the big thing to take home. Radio pulse is a great rough measurement for what that map is. So it's real easy. Just like back in training, you just take that radio pulse. If it's weak or absent, you know they've got a map. <laughs> that's going down fast. You know that their the solid blood pressure is going to be less than 80. It's a rough measurement, but hey, it works. So, fluid resuscitation strategy. If they're not in shock, don't give the fluids. Start that IV set on um, saline lock and leave it there for access. 
don't give fluids. Wait till they eat. You absolutely eat it. In the field, we were actually teaching our guys that PO fluids, just give them by mouth. In the field, oh, you know, a lot of the surgery community said, you can't do that. What if they have the belly wound? Well, the recent studies have shown that you can they successfully rehydrate them and decrease their dehydration, and it's not going to increase your mortality. So it depends on what your jurisdiction is and what your teaching is locally, but just know that it is okay if you can give them oral fluids. So the other thing is that dehydration is also part of the process. Remember, you're talking about fluid hydration IV or oral. They're different mechanisms, but they're both good when you need them. So IV fluids, minimize crystalloid use. Okay, saline and ringer's lactate. Traditional resuscitation fluids can further dilute your clotting factors. It's not good. So normal saline and lactate ringers are non-physiologic fluids. They can worsen the, the situation. There are large volumes of these things cause pro-inflammatory processes that when they get to be in, to the emergency department, massive transfusion makes things much worse. So your goals of fluid resuscitation improve their state of consciousness, help a radio pulse, don't over resuscitate. Remember that pop and clot phenomenon. And your choices are Hexten or Rimaflactin or normal saline. I would argue for Hexten. It is much better. It's to carry enough Ringer's lactate that you need, 2.4 um, pounds of fluid will only expand your circulation blood loss of about 200 milliliters after the fluid's been given. And if you have that other 800 fluids, where's it going? Not to any place good. So I say Hexten, and we've, we've done lots of studies on this. 500 milliliters of Hexen is 1.3 pounds. The intervascular expansion, after eight hours, it's still there. So it may cost a little bit more. It may um, it end up being about um, a lot, lot less weight, but I think it's definitely worth the, what you need for it. So compare your fluids, seven pounds for crystalloid, not good. And recap, control the bleeding first, Hexen, Hexen, Hexen. Hemostatic agents, tourniquets, all good for you. Matter that metal stat check's the big thing. And I think that's about it. Anybody have any questions? Thank you.